All righty. So today we are looking at, of course, I looked right at the sun right as I started recording. Sneeze in five minutes. Uh, <laughs> all right. So we are looking at uh, day three here. This is respiratory system physiology. So we started by talking about the need for energy and metabolism. Then the next day, we kind of started diving into the first way that we start breaking down uh, nutrients in order to have energy to burn for our metabolism. Well, now we are looking at uh, the other part of that energy, right? Uh, where we bring in some oxygen to produce even more energy. Um, so, you know, originally it was just talking about the concept. Then we were talking about like, you know, glucose. We got to use that to produce ATP. But then eventually if you add some oxygen in with that glucose, you get a ton of energy. And so that's really what we're gonna look at today, um, which is really fun. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one because it's gonna talk a lot about how stuff moves around. Um, and, and we're gonna talk about like the anatomy and structure of our, of our lungs and, and how, um, you know, it's pretty amazing how oxygen actually gets into our bloodstream. It's a very cool process. So we're gonna be looking at that today. So, um, oh, there's no intro slides. Oh, weird. Uh, well, I always do an intro anyway, so <laughs> uh, that's our goals today, our learning objectives today are to kind of get um, an understanding of all of that. So when we talk about pulmonary ventilation, we're talking about the process of, you know, breathing, right? That's sort of the, uh, I guess you could call it the scientific term for breathing, right? It's, it's pulmonary ventilation, pulmonary for the word lungs uh, and ventilation for, you know, bringing air into and out of them. And so when we look at that, the goal here is to make oxygen available to our bloodstream. So yesterday we talked about how the digestive system is responsible for taking, you know, a hamburger or an apple or a bowl of uh, a salad, you know, and breaking it down so small into tiny, 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 tiny pieces that it was nothing but chemicals. And then those chemicals are able to pass into our bloodstream you know, and then they go through our liver, they get detoxified, and then they head out to the rest of the body to, to give us energy, you know, repair certain substances throughout the body, give our body structure, you know, they do all kinds of different things. Once what, our body does a lot of stuff with that food, you know, um, even if it is something relatively unhealthy, our body's like, all right, well, that's bad for us, but we're going to break it down and make the best of it, you know, um, and that's pretty freaking cool. Uh, but the way that happened is we have this entire system, this digestive system that breaks food down so small that it is literally able to pass from outside of our body inside of our body, right? It's able to pass through our small intestines, passing through the walls, you know? Um, well, today we're going to look at the exact same concept, just in a very different area. We're going to talk about how we actually breathe in oxygen and that oxygen is able to pass through the walls of our lungs and get attached to some red blood cells. And then those red blood cells are going to carry that oxygen to wherever it needs to go for us to be able to produce energy, right? Every single cell in your body needs to be able to breathe, you know? Um, so it's always kind of fun, uh, you know, to talk about because like, Breathing is a huge deal. Like your, your cells getting oxygen is literally what keeps them alive. Again, this is why I was saying there can be no zombies. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't, it's just never really gonna happen. The closest you can get is like, if there's like a rabies like thing. Um, but those, you know, those aren't dead people. Uh, or the second closest you could get is if there was ever like a, like a fungus that took over our brain and made us do something. Um, but in terms of like bringing the dead back to life, it's really just not going to happen because your cells have lost the ability to produce energy. And since they've lost that ability, it's really hard to get it back. And so uh, actually a big part of that is, you know, um, I always ask people this, uh, what do you guys think, you know, when you sit on your leg for a really long time and your foot falls asleep, what, what's happening right there? What's, what's going on there if I asked you guys? Is feeling uh, like it, you can move or it's stuck there. The yeah, it feels stuck. Your, your leg falls asleep. Your leg falls asleep. Yeah, but is it what's what's why did it fall asleep? What happened? Because the blood flow, maybe. Mm. Yeah. So that's a pretty common answer. But here's the thing. If it actually pinched off the blood flow and your leg wasn't getting any blood anymore, 
your leg couldn't breathe. It means it wouldn't get any oxygen delivery. You know what would happen? Your leg would fall off. It would literally die, and that would be it. You would have no leg. <laughs> so lucky for us, that is not what's happening. When you sit on your leg for a long time, what you're actually doing is you're actually pinching a nerve. You're actually cutting off your nervous system's connection to your leg. So then what's happening is your nervous system's like, man, I haven't heard from leg in a while. Hey, leg, are you still down there? And then like they don't get anything back. And they're like, leg, what? You know, <laughs> it starts swimming. And then eventually, all of a sudden, you move and you change position. And then you feel all of that screaming. <laughs> That's basically little pings that your nervous system is sending, like, are you down there? You know, um, it's like when you call, uh, I don't know about you guys, but like my parents love to not answer their phone for days at a time. Uh, and it's like, where are you guys? <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> um, so that is, uh, that's what's going on with like that. And, and luckily it's not your blood flow, you know? Um, so today we're talking about why blood flow is so, so important. Um, because it is going to allow us to deliver oxygen and oxygen delivery is absolutely key. So, um, you do have your cardiorespiratory system, right? When we're talking about this, we're talking about your cardiorespiratory system. Now, this term is a little interesting. Um, in fact, what's kind of funny is like, uh, I'm sure if I were to like hit space here. Uh, uh, hold on, it's actually saying that the word is wrong. Cardiorespiratory. Yeah, you can see like, it's so funny. Like this is a term that is a very real term, but Microsoft Word does not think it is a word. Cardio, you, you forgot to put the D. Oh, did I? Oh. Yeah. Oh, maybe I added it to my library. Well, on most default ones, it doesn't think it's a word. Um, it's kind of funny, but your cardiorespiratory system, it, it, it actually really kind of isn't its own system. Like, to be fair, it's, it's not its own thing. Like, it's two systems working together that makes up your cardiorespiratory system. So it is made up of your cardiovascular system. This is sometimes co called your circulatory system. And it is also made up of your respiratory system. So your cardiovascular system is your heart, your blood throughout your body, and all of the blood vessels. That's the cardiovascular system. Your respiratory system is your lungs and all of your respiratory passageways. So even like your throat and even a little bit of your rib cage is considered part of your respiratory system. And uh, that's interesting. Uh, Can you repeat this again, please? Um, the cardiovascular and circulatory system. Yes, uh, that's interesting. Why was that missing? Um, so your cardio your cardiorespiratory system is uh, the system made up of both the respiratory, right, um, and the cardiovascular system. So it is your cardiorespiratory system, but it's not really its own thing. It's these two systems working together. And the two systems are your respiratory system, which is made up of your respiratory pump and your respiratory passageways. So your respiratory pump is like your diaphragm, right? Your diaphragm is this little, it's this little muscle that sits like this when it's resting. Um, it actually sits in kind of this interesting little dome shaped. And then what it does is when it contracts, it flattens down like this, and then it goes back into its dome shape. And then it, re it contracts, and relaxes. And what that does is that draws air into your lungs or it pushes air out of your lungs. So that's your respiratory pump. And then your respiratory passageways are all of these little tiny tubes. There's this really huge tube that makes up your throat. And then it branches into either lung. And then those branches break off. And then those break off. And then those break off. And they get really, really small until they finally get microscopic. And that's your respiratory passageways. And so an oxygen molecule might head down and then it takes a left and a right and a left and a right. You know, it goes, you know, go down to the, you know, go down to the uh, dachshund and then take a left. And then you're going to go down about a quarter mile and take a, you know, like that's how <laughs> oxygen is kind of traveling through your lungs until eventually it gets to the very end and where it's going. And it'll get to this area that is covered in blood vessels. And those blood vessels are where blood cells are being exposed 
to your oxygen. And so what's going to happen is your body will exchange a molecule of oxygen for a molecule of CO2. And then you will exhale that CO2 and it will get outside of your body. So how do we make sure that it's exposed to all of that, uh, all of those blood cells? Well, that is where your cardiovascular system comes in, right? Your cardiovascular system uh, is responsible for delivering the oxygen throughout the body. That's your heart, which is pumping it around the body, your blood, which is carrying it around your body, and your blood vessels like arteries, veins, capillaries, and things like that, that are covering your body's tissues and allowing the blood cells to have somewhere to go. So when we look at the overall purpose of that system, those two systems working together, we call it the cardiorespiratory system. And when you think about it, its main function is to deliver oxygen to the mitochondria of your cells. This is what is allowing your cells to produce energy and stay alive. So that's the main job. So when you think about the cardiorespiratory system, it is pr its primary responsibility is to ensure proper cellular functioning. And that's a term, that's actually the way NASA will describe it in your regular textbook. And we'll see that term later on. Um, but for now, we're teaching it this way. Uh, it is, it's delivering oxygen to the mitochondria of the cells, which obviously, like I said, is allowing that proper cellular functioning. So uh, before I dive into the lungs here, I want to show you guys a video. So get ready to be introduced to some videos that I really love showing in class. Um, so by the way, and, and so Roy, I don't know if you're interested um, uh, when, or anybody, if you guys are interested, but this is actually uh, a YouTube channel that I use a lot in class. Um, it is uh, the Crash Course channel, uh, and it is by... Uh, these two guys who, you know, I've been watching for a long time on YouTube anyways, anyways. they basically have these, oh, can you, do you have a question? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just putting it, typing it in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so these, these two guys, uh, I don't know if you guys, did you guys ever see the movie, The Fault in Our Stars or read the book? I, I saw it. So that movie was written by uh, this guy right here. Uh, actually, I can't really tell which photo is which in the pictures, but uh, it was written by a guy named John Green. And John Green uh, and his brother Hank Green, who's going to be in the video that we're about to watch, uh, started this YouTube channel. It is a free channel. You guys can watch as many videos as you want. And they have basically, um, they do, they teach uh, in little 10 minute segments everything from world history to politics, to economics, to government, uh, and our favorite biology and physiology. Oh, and world history, which I love, by the way. I actually, I gotta tell you guys, I didn't really like studying history in school. I thought it was kind of boring and I was just like, I, I didn't have a very good teacher. Uh, and then I went, recently went through all of this US history uh, class right here and it is awesome. <laughs> now I'm like a history buff. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, these videos are really awesome. So <clears throat> we're going to watch our first one and then we're going to watch the second one afterwards. Oh my God. My cereal is trying to kill me. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Good God. Introduce you to one of the bravest pioneers in the history of life on planet Earth. An organism that blazed the trail for every single vertebrate that lives on land today and many that don't. It's one of your most important ancestors. Meat? Well, it doesn't have a name. And we don't exactly know what it looked like either. But we do know that about 380 million years ago, this fishy looking thing with big fleshy fins achieved one of the animal kingdom's greatest milestones breathing air. Sounds simple enough, but believe me, it wasn't, because for billions of years before this fishy ancestor came around, basically all of life evolved in water. From the very beginning, the earliest, the simplest forms of life, like bacteria, extracted oxygen they needed right from the water through their membranes. And they did it through simple diffusion, when a material automatically flows from where it is concentrated to where it is left. So it bounces out. Diffusion works really well, and it requires zero effort, but wasn't going to cut it in the big leagues. Anything larger than a small worm is simply too big and needs too much oxygen for diffusion to work. So in order to get bigger, early life forms needed a circulatory system that could move bulk amounts of oxygen around faster inside their bodies and a respiratory system to bring more oxygen in contact with their wet membranes. So their respiratory surfaces moved from their outer 
other surfaces to be insides of their bodies. First there were gills, but gills of course still only work inside of water. And a little more than 380 million years ago, this was starting to lose some of its charm. Earth was getting warmer, the seas were getting shallower, and much of the surface water had lower concentrations of oxygen than it used to. Finally, a humble little lobe-finned fish got fed up, swam up to the water's surface, and started breathing air. It could do this because it had evolved a fancy new interface to move gases between the air and its cell membranes. I'm talking about lungs. Wet lungs. With an efficient new way to take in nearly limitless amounts of oxygen from air, animals were eventually able to get bigger and more diverse over the ages, and now all of us lung-having vertebrates share that common ancestor. For lots of animals, including humans, those lungs come with a bunch of other equipment, like protective ribs, a stiff trachea, and in mammals, a strong diaphragm. And together, they form your respiratory system, which happens to be best friends and business partners with your circulatory system. It's only by working together and using both the bulk flow and simple diffusion of oxygen that they can make possible the process of cellular respiration. In other words, life itself. So a lot of improvements have been made to it over the eons, but the respiratory system that you are using right now is your inheritance from that ancient ambitious fish, leader of one of the most important anatomical revolutions of the past half billion years. Pretend for a minute that you can't breathe. Like, you just don't have lungs anymore. You are some bizarre evolutionary oddity. A huge, human-shaped organism that doesn't have a respiratory system. Instead, you get all of your oxygen the way that your oldest, smallest evolutionary ancestors did, by simple diffusion. Or at least, you try to get all your oxygen that way. How would it work? Well, poorly. And that's partly because one of the keys to efficient diffusion of any material is distance. If you want a molecule to diffuse across a space quickly, you want it to be as close to its destination as possible with the fewest obstacles in the way. But for a single molecule of oxygen to diffuse from the air through, say, your scalp and then go to a neuron deep inside your brain, it would have to move through your skin and then your skull and then your connective tissue and all sorts of things. It would eventually get there, like maybe a month later, but at that point, the cell that needed the oxygen in the first place would have, you know, suffocated to death. Basically, obtaining oxygen through diffusion alone is like wanting to go to a party at your friend's place. Friend's place. place. You could do it, but it would take forever, and by the time you arrived, you'd be all haggard and the party would be over. So diffusion alone isn't enough to get the job done. We do use it, but only when a whole bunch of the materials we need are right up against the tissues that can absorb them. So you know what else we need? Bulk flow. Bulk flow is like public transportation. It moves large numbers of molecules quickly. Rather than walk the whole way across town, you can hop on a bus with a bunch of other people and get there in 20 minutes. Every time you take a deep breath, you bring in about 100 quintillion oxygen molecules into your lungs all at once. They're on a bulk flow bus <coughs> ride. And once those oxygen molecules filter down into the cells in your lungs, they're suddenly very close to the blood they're trying to reach. All they have to do is diffuse across four layers of cell membranes to get from the lung cell into the blood. It's like hopping off the bus and then walking a half a block to your friend's apartment. That's why your respiratory system is the way it is. It's set up to take full advantage of both bulk flow and simple diffusion. The bulk flow part of things is handled by some of your system's biggest and most obvious moving parts, starting with your lungs, which basically operate like like a pump or a bellows. They don't have any contractible muscle tissue because they need to be able to expand, so they require outside help in order to move. Enter the diaphragm, a big, thin set of muscles that separates your thorax from your abdomen. <coughs> when your lungs empty, your diaphragm relaxes and looks kind of like an arc pushing up to squish your lungs. You also have the weight of your rib cage pushing on your lungs from the top and sides, and together these forces decrease the volume of your lungs. When you breathe in, your diaphragm contracts pulling itself flat, and your external intercostal muscles between your ribs contract. They lift the ribs up and out, causing the chest cavity to expand. This makes the pressure inside your lungs lower than the air outside your body, and since fluids like gases move from areas of high pressure to low pressure, the lungs fill up with outside air. Then the diaphragm relaxes again, and the weight of the ribs settles in, and the pressure inside the lungs becomes higher than the outside air, and the air rushes out. And that, my friends, is breathing 101. Now, your respiratory system contains a lot of parts besides your lungs, some prominently displayed on your face, others hidden deep within your chest, and functionally, all of these organs fall into one of two physiological zones. The upper parts that funnel the air in make up what's known as the conducting zone, and it starts with this thing. Your nose is supported by bone and cartilage and the bristly hairs and mucus inside it that help filter out dust and other particles. But it, along with your sinuses, performs another important function. It warms and moistens incoming air so it doesn't dry out those sensitive lung cells that must remain wet. Remember, moisture is key. We evolved from organisms that lived in water, so just 
just like with our aquatic bacterial ancestors, we need water for oxygen to dissolve into before it can diffuse across the phospholipid bilayer membrane of our cells. Now, if you've ever choked on a poorly timed sip of water, you've noticed that you breathe through the same tube that you also move foods and liquids through. This is yet another leftover from those first fish lungs, which evolved as a branch off the esophagus. Looking back, it was not ideal, but we are stuck with it. So the stuff that you swallow <laughs> during the country's the apparatus, a little trap door of tissue, which covers the larynx and directs bites of sandwich and sips of cola towards your esophagus. And That's what's bothering me right now. And you'll notice that the esophagus <laughs> Your stomach is nice and flexible, <coughs> while the trachea, or windpipe, is rigid and has prominent rings. That's because your trachea is basically built like a vacuum hose. Since the lungs create negative pressure with every breath, the trachea needs those rings to keep it open. If it was soft and floppy, it would collapse every time the pressure dropped and you wouldn't be able to breathe. From there, the trachea splits in two, forming the right and left main bronchi. You can imagine these inner lung parts as sort of an upside-down tree. Now we are in the lung tissue and have entered what we call the respiratory zone. This is where the actual gas exchange occurs, and everything you find here has a form to suit that function. So the smaller branches of the upside-down tree are bronchioles, which taper down into progressively narrower tubes until they empty into the alveolar ducts, and then dead end into tiny alveolar sacs, where the bulk of the gas exchange finally occurs. Because that's where each sac contains a cluster of alveoli these tiny cavities lined with super thin wet membranes made of simple squamous epithelium tissue. It's here that oxygen molecules dissolve in the wet mucus, diffuse across the epithelial cells, and then cross the single the layer of endothelial cells lining the capillaries to enter the bloodstream. And of course, it's also where carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood and then follows the same route back up to the nose and mouth where it's exhaled. So it's your alveoli where diffusion meets bulk flow, because while you're picking up oxygen and dispensing with CO2 one molecule at a time, you're doing it in enormous quantities at any given second. Both of your lungs contain about 700 million alveoli, which together provide an amazing 75 square meters of moist membrane surface area. So the principles that make respiration possible are relatively simple, diffusion and bulk flow, and so are the mechanisms of the body that use them. It just took us about 400 million years to figure out how to make it all work. But today you learned how it does work, including the mechanics of both simple diffusion and bulk flow, and the physiology of breathing, and the anatomy of the conducting zone and the respiratory zone of your respiratory system. Thank you to all of our Patreon patrons who help make Crash Course possible <coughs> for themselves and for everyone in the world for free with their monthly contributions. If you like Crash Course and you want to help us keep making videos like this one, you can go to patreon.com slash Crash Course. This episode was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake DiPestino and their consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed and edited by Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor was Nicole Keeney. Our sound designer is Michael Ronda. And the graphics team. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about um, the next part of lungs here in just a little bit. There's a second video. Um, but, and I know, uh, by the way, I, Hank Green talks incredibly fast. You think I talk fast? Look at that guy. Uh, <laughs> but um, I really think that even if he's going a little speedy, um, the animations are really, really helpful and they kind of help you with like the anatomy and the physiology and stuff. Uh, and that way I don't have to draw too many times on Microsoft Paint, which I'm sure everybody in this call appreciates after yesterday. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and look at uh, our lungs here, right? So your lungs are, like you said, they're these, these kind of wet, squishy sacs that don't have any muscle of their own. They don't have any ability to contract. Um, they have to be really flexible in order to be able to like uh, expand and you know rest back to a normal size. So luckily you've got other materials that are gonna allow that um, to happen, but <clears throat> oxygen is gonna be moved into and out of the lungs uh, with your conduction tree, right? So that's your, the, the, the branches of you, what are called bronchi that come down, right? So your lungs are these large, empty sac-like structures that are able to house the conducting part of your respiratory system. And that conducting part are going to be things like your bronchi, your bronchioles, and your alveoli. So if you notice the notes are getting a little, you know, it's indenting a little bit. Well, that's kind of how this the oxygen is going to travel. It's going to go, you know, into these big bronchi, and then those are going to branch down into these little smaller bronchioles, and they're going to branch into your alveoli. So when we look at that, right, uh, let's see here, bronchi and bronchioles. whoops. Starting to get where we get the word bronchitis from. 
Um, but you'll see it actually looks kind of like this. It's your trachea, and then it branches. This is what's called your pr uh, primary bronchi. Um, those are like the main ones. And then that actually branches into smaller bits. And eventually it gets so small um, that it will end in these little itty bitty sacs right here. These are called your alveoli sacs, right? And that is covered. You can see there's little blood vessels covering the whole thing. And they've got, a, they've got the blood vessels drawn in red and blue here. The reason for that is because you're seeing where like the red is where oxygen is coming to the alveoli and then the blue is where it's being taken from it. So I'm sorry, did I say oxygen? I meant blood. Where uh, the red is where blood is showing up and the blue is where blood is being taken away, which is exactly what we want, right? We wanna get our blood in, we wanna pick up some oxygen, get rid of some CO2, and then we wanna get our blood back out of there so it can get to the heart and then travel to wherever it is it's going, right? So each lung has your primary bronchi and your secondary bronchi, which are the smaller branches. And eventually they branch down smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we have a different term for them, uh, which we are gonna call bronchioles. And bronchioles are little tiny microscopic branches. And they're the ones that house what are called your alveoli. Uh, and your alveoli are these little itty bitty, they kind of look like, I, I always like think I think they're like popcorn, they're little popcorn shaped sacks, right? Um, at the end of every one of your, uh, uh, at, the ever, at the end of all your bronchioles. And they are covered, like I said, in um, capillaries. So you can see here, uh, again, like I said, you've got the red, the, the drawn in red and you've got the drawn in blue, but notice how they form like these beds that absolutely cover the tissues. So this is what is known as a capillary bed. Um, and a capillary bed is basically little tiny microscopic blood vessels. Um, you guys have seen your capillary beds, uh, or at least you've seen the product of them if you've ever bruised yourself really badly. You know, if you remember you know, playing sports and you got hit by someone real hard, or you're walking around a corner and you smacked your arm or something, and you get just like a big freaking bruise. Um, what you're actually seeing is, uh, you know, you, all of your body's tissues, you are covered head to toe in capillaries. And uh, they're so small, they're actually, they're microscopic. And in fact, one of the things we're gonna talk about today, sometimes these tubes are smaller than the red blood cells, which sounds really impossible because you're like, wait a minute, the blood cells are traveling through the tubes. How can they be smaller? Well, that's what's, what's kind of interesting about your blood cells. They're shaped like little donuts, right? Well, that makes them really good folding and they can squeeze through, which gives them a little bit of pressure. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit, but um, these are so small. These, these blood vessels can get so small, it's pretty easy to break. So, you know, if you hit yourself hard enough, you can break those blood vessels and those blood vessels start leaking and you're going to see blood pool under your skin. And that's what a bruise is. So but that is happen. happen, for example, with, with the old people when they when it, they start changing the yep the skin so uh actually next module or no not in two modules we are going to have our senior program design class and soroya that's one of the things we're going to talk about um as we get older our blood vessels tend to stiffen a little bit and all of our body's tissues tend to get a little bit thinner so they get thinner and stiffer which makes them much 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 easier to break and that's why older folks tend to bruise a little bit easier than younger folks <laughs> Good connection. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, if we're looking at ventilation, right? So if we're talking about the process of like breathing in, luckily you've got a lot of other parts of like what we call that conduction zone, right? Um, and so that conduction zone, it's gonna be your nose, right? You can breathe through here, but you can also breathe through your mouth. Both of those actually share a common tube right here. And then you can see you, you've got your pharynx, which is where it is actually connecting. It's where your, your sinuses are coming down and connecting with your throat. And then that's going to lead to your larynx, which is where your vocal cords are located. And then there's actually a little flap right there that he mentioned in the video uh, that is going to separate where it is heading into your lungs. Or let's say you ate some food, that is where, you know, that little flap is open. And then as soon as you swallow, it's going to close down like that. And then food's going to travel down into your stomach instead of going into your lungs. Um, and that little flap is actually, uh, you know, it's, it's muscular. It's controlled by muscles. That's also why um, one thing that we also tend to see in seniors is that they sometimes struggle like 
swallowing certain bits of food or they'll get food going down the wrong pipe more often because that flap gets a little bit slow as we old, as we get a little bit older. And that's why uh, what ends up happening then is like food gets into your lungs instead of getting into your digestive system. And now bacteria has a chance to be like, oh my God, there's like a meal down here. I can live down here. And then that's why it's so common for older folks to get uh, things like bronchitis and pneumonia and things like that. So <clears throat> that's why that's such a common condition that we see. Um, so uh, anyway, so your nose, you get your, no uh, your nose, pharynx, larynx, trachea, then it branches down into your bronchi, which will branch down into bronchioles. And at the very end of those bronchioles, you will end with your alveoli and alveolar sacs. Um, which are the little popcorn shaped sacs there. Um, now, the purpose of all this, the reason we're getting so many branches, the reason that we're doing this is because we need to increase the amount of surface area available to oxygen. So in the same way that your small intestine was like a fold and another fold and another fold, and then that had little folds on it. And then at the end of each of those little folds, there were little hairs, right? Like, in the same way that we, you know, your small intestine, the reason that it had all of those big folds and different little tiny hairs on them is because that increases the amount of surface area, right? Um, and just one of the ways I always like to explain surface area, you know, is, you know, if I had a box here and I asked you to paint all four sides of this box, you know, it wouldn't be all that difficult, right? Like you'd, you'd use a little bit of paint here, you'd use a little bit of paint here, here, and here, right? But I could increase the surface area of this box really easily uh, just by like erasing one side. I need to figure out how to make this eraser bigger. And I just haven't, I don't know how to do it yet. Uh, but if I go like this, I've changed the shape of the box slightly, but now there's more surface area. Right now you've got to paint this, 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 and then rather than painting a straight line across, you've got to go down here and up like this. Well, you know, I could do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and eventually like increase the surface area like crazy. I mean, in your, in your small intestine, you're going like this, right? All those like little folds. And then we've got all the little villi on top of those folds, right? That increases surface area. Well, in your lungs, it's the exact same thing. You've got this big tube that branches down like this, and then that one branches down, and then that one branches down, and then that one branches, you know, until eventually it gets microscopic and it ends in this little popcorn shaped sack. And that is, ex and then you'd have your, you know, your, your lungs here, right? Um, and so like that is where, you know, that is how we are increasing surface area. We have access to way, way, way more oxygen. You know, there are still like on the planet today, um, they still have lungs and, and, you know, they don't only get oxygen this way, but there are like amphibians uh, who actually like the, you know, they're frogs and salamanders and things like that. And they just stay wet all of the time. And the reason they stay wet all the time is because that makes it easier to, for oxygen to diffuse. And they actually breathe through their skin. Oxygen just moves through. And that's great if you're a little tiny, like lizard, you know, um, that's a piece of cake if you, if you're itty bitty, but when you've got a huge body, like a human being, and a big complicated nervous system, which needs lots of oxygen to survive, billions and billions of cells to produce energy to make you think and, you know, respond to things. You know, when you're something complicated like us, we need to have access to lots of oxygen molecules. Like you said, over uh, a quintillion uh, molecules of oxygen every time you breathe in, which is a big number. <laughs> so, um, so that is sort of the whole purpose here. And then the other final part of that, the reason we have all of this is because it is going to warm air, which is going to make it easier for oxygen to travel. Um, I am no physics expert, but uh, just a very brief rundown. We know that stuff expands when it gets hot, right? And we know stuff constricts when it gets cold. You know, that's why if you can't open a jar, you run it under hot water and then pops right off. Um, well, that's one of the reasons why, you know, you are bringing air into this warm environment. It makes it easier for oxygen to pass into your bloodstream. 
and then it also moistens it a little bit. And because there's just a little bit of like moisture in your lungs as well, that also makes it easier for oxygen to pass in there. And you've experienced it where like it kind of, it's kind of hard to breathe in like a really dry environment sometimes. That's why people buy humidifiers. Um, and other people, you know, that's also why uh, when you, you know, I just got back from Washington. There were a few times where like, you know, I was like, hey, I'm gonna go out and get the mail for you guys. I walked outside, it was a hole there. I was like, <coughs> you know, like, oh God, because it was freezing, right? Um, and so like, those are both things that we need to do to make it easy for oxygen to get into our body. Now, at the alveoli, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be a little bit of a mucous membrane uh, that's going to filter air and allow clean air to come in, right? Um, and so when we talk about like, you know, that kind of stuff, this is one of the reasons why smoking is so, so exceptionally bad for you, right? Um, I, one of the reasons I always talk about how smoking is just one of the worst decisions you can make. Um, and I know that like it's 2021 now uh, and there's lots of versions of smoking. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's legal to smoke pot and it's, it's, there's, uh, there's vaping and there's all this stuff, you know, here's the thing, putting stuff into your lungs is a bad idea. I love camping. It is one of my all time favorite things. Uh, I try to do it as often as possible. The reality is campfires are not good for me, you know, um, but it's a calculated, you know, it's a calculated risk. Uh, and you know, I'm taking it into account. If you want to make a calculated risk and choose to smoke cigarettes every day, that's a much, much, much higher risk. But one of the reasons this is so very bad for you is because you are taking this environment that is designed to work with diffusion, right? So he mentioned it in the, he mentioned it uh, briefly in the video, but what diffusion is, right? Imagine I've got a wall here, right? So I've got a little wall, I've got a little membrane. Uh, and uh, this is one of my favorite phrases. You guys are going to hear me say this all the time. Um, so if you want to understand how the universe works, um, here's one of a, here's a principle that will help you understand all of biology, physics, physiology, whatever. It'll help you understand everything. Um, keep this rule in mind. Nature hates gradients. Nature is kind of a socialist. <laughs> uh, not trying to get political, but nature is kind of a socialist. Nature does not like it when there is a lot of stuff over here and very little stuff over there. Nature does not like that. So if there's a lot of stuff over here, what will happen naturally is stuff will move until there is an even concentration on both sides. That's actually why oxygen moves into your blood cells. So if I have Oh man, come on. All right, hold on. I got to figure out how to make this bigger because it's just not going to work otherwise. There we go. All right. What the? What? Hang on. Um... No. A bigger brush is all. Oh, there it is. Size. Oh my gosh, I'm so dumb. All right. <laughs> bigger. There we go. All right, so if I've got a whole bunch of oxygen molecules over here, right? So there's a ton of oxygen over here, right? And here I've got some oxygen, but you can see not very much, right? What is gonna happen is thanks to diffusion, nature is naturally going to move everything this way until the concentration is the same on both sides. That's diffusion in a nutshell. So you know what's funny? Let's say that these little black ones here are uh, oxygen. And now let's say that these little uh, red ones here are CO2. So now I've got a little bit of CO2 on this side, but I've got a whole bunch of oxygen. But over here, I have got tons of CO2, like a whole freaking bunch of it, right? Well, now what's gonna happen is nature is gonna want my CO2 to go this way, and it's gonna want my oxygen to go this way. And that is simple diffusion inside of our lungs, right? Um, and every time you do that in, your, at, at the, in the blood vessels at your lungs, they're gonna switch 
And that's how you exhale CO2 and how you inhale oxygen. Um, does that make sense, guys? Cool. Um, and we learned a little bit more about Microsoft Paint. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so at the lungs, um, oxygen is going to enter the blood and CO2 is going to enter the lungs. We're saying that because like, we're talking about the blood cells here. Um, sometimes that sentence, CO2 entering the lungs, that sentence by itself is confusing people. Don't, but what we mean is like, it's leaving the blood cell entering the lung so it can get exhaled. And oxygen is leaving the lung and entering the inside of your body onto the blood cell so that it can get to where it's going. Now, like I said, one of the reasons why smoking is so very bad for you is this is happening because of diffusion, right? This little thin wall here is the only thing that's separating this, which means it's really easy for it to happen. But what happens, we'll put it in green because it's nasty. Um, <laughs> what happens if you cover that wall with crap? <laughs> right? What happens if you cover it with tar from smoking uh, cigarettes? What happens if you cover it from a little bit of tar from smoking marijuana or, or the, the materials? I don't actually know what's found in vaping because I haven't taken the time to learn about it yet. Um, I'm sure it's tar as well. But what happens if you cover all of that stuff? Well, it's going to be a lot harder for this diffusion process to take place. And that is why, you know, that's exactly why there's a case for, you know, avoiding smoking as much as possible. Um, we want to get that out of our client's lifestyle. We are going to try our best to convince our clients to avoid that as much as possible. Now, if you do want to have a conversation about like all of the other types of smoking, like if you want to find a way to, to still participate in, you know, some of that, um, you know, there are ways that you can do that that are healthier. Um, but that is a different conversation and it totally doesn't belong in this class. So, <laughs> uh, all right, let's go ahead and talk about ventilation. So now let's look at the process of breathing a little bit, right? So we've talked about, um, we talked a little bit about the idea of like our lungs moving to where they need to go, but let's talk about how we actually move our lungs, right? Because again, your lungs have no muscle of their own. They don't have any tissue or any ability to contract or relax. So because of that, ventilation, which is the, the process of moving air into and out of the lungs, um, we need to have some muscles that are gonna allow that to happen. And that's where your diaphragm comes in. Uh, hold on just a second here. Uh, yeah, this is going to come back later. Um, but this is where your diaphragm comes in. Your diaphragm uh, is, like I said, it's this dome-shaped muscle. It actually, when it's in a relaxed position, it relaxes like this. Um, and when it contracts, it flattens down. And what that does is it's kind of like if you were to grab the outside of a paper sack and pull it open, right? That would cause a bunch of air to rush into that sac. That's exactly what's happening to your lungs. Your lung, your diaphragm contracts down and it draws your lungs open. So your lungs not, might not be able to contract, but the thing that they are attached to does. Meanwhile, you are also gonna contract some secondary respiratory muscles in your that are gonna allow your rib cage to expand a little bit. Uh, and that's also going to allow your lungs to expand even further. And then luckily our rib cage is a little bit heavy. So when our diaphragm relaxes back into its dome shape, that's gonna push air out of our lungs. And when our rib cage rests back down, which is nice and heavy, that's also going to push air out of our lungs. And so your rib cage and your diaphragm are both helping with this ventilation process, right? Um, and that's another reason why it gets hard to breathe as we get older, you know? Um, by the way, COVID, right? Like just while we're actually, while we're here talking about ventilation and stuff, COVID is a, is a, um, uh, it is a, uh, a novel coronavirus, right? And what that means is that it is a virus that infects your lungs and makes it, uh, fill, uh, it fills them with like fluid and mucus and things like that and it covers your bronchioles ability. So you may be drawing, you know, a lot of times people like think that it's 
uh, like a lot about coughing, you know, they'll, <clears throat> that's like COVID. Uh, or they think that it's like, oh, you know, they're just not able to get, you know, a big breath in. It's not that, like they're actually breathing plenty of oxygen into their lungs, but that oxygen cannot pass from their outside environment, outside, you know, in the lungs themselves to the inside, it can't get to their bloodstream. And that's why it's so hard. You know, that's, that's what this is doing. I mean, Soroya, um, you were saying, you know, you've been, you've been sort of quarantined with this thing. Um, did you ever have like where it was very different? It just felt like you were short of breath. No, I, I, my only symptom it, 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 I have it is uh, I have uh, I feel tired sometimes, but for breathing and I'm fine. Real? Oh man, good. I mean, that's awesome. That's that's good news. Means that your immune system, for the most part, kicked that thing's butt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, love that. Um, uh, so yeah, um, and the reason you feel tired, yeah, there's there's other parts of this virus as well. I mean, your body is expending so much energy to try to kill that virus, um, and then you're also not getting very, you know, as much oxygen in. Um, so ventilation, like I said, moving air into and out of the lungs. So for air to move in the lungs, this is where we have to understand the idea of pressure. So um, we look at this, right? We look at the simple diffusion here. You know, uh, there's two parts to this. There's a concentration gradient, which again, like I said, nature hates gradients, right? And you, uh, when I say gradient, you know, what I'm talking about is like, you know, um, this is a great, oof, that was bad. You know what? I can literally do this. <laughs> this is a gradient, right? Um, there is a whole lot of stuff over here, and then there's less and less stuff over here, right? So uh, this is a high, texting, uh, this is a high concentration. Let me make that bigger. Uh, let's go 14. So that's a high concentration on that side. And then this is a low concentration, right? Which means there's, you know, lots of stuff over here, very little stuff over here. So what's going to happen is it's going to roll downhill, you know, um, it's going to, it's going to move in this direction. So that is a concentration gradient. Um, <clears throat> there are also pressure gradients and pressure gradients are basically exactly the same thing. There is an area of uh, high pressure. So we'll go ahead and delete this. And we'll say this is an area of high pressure. And then it would move, you know, uh, to an area of low pressure, right? Um, so if there is, you know, very little, actually, you know what? It would actually move this way. <laughs> um, I've actually got this like backwards. Hold on. <laughs> um, so that's a concentration gradient. Pressure gradient would go the other way. Um, this would be high pressure. Ah, typing is hard, apparently. Uh, and then this is an area of low pressure, right? And so the reason this is an area of high pressure, you know, is because we've squeezed all of this stuff here. So what's going to happen is it's naturally going to move this way, right? We're squeezing here. So those air molecules are going to move this way. That's why you know, bulk amounts of gases enter your lungs. You know, your lungs are closed when your diaphragm is relaxed, but when your diaphragm contracts, that opens all the space. Now suddenly there is less pressure in your lungs than there is out here in the environment. And so what happens is air is like, let's go this way, right? And it rushes in. Um, so that's how you make all of these gases available, you know, to your bloodstream. But then the oxygen molecules are a concentration gradient, you know, where there is a lot of stuff on one side and, very, and little stuff on the other. And that is what causes the individual little oxygen molecules to move one way rather than the other. Uh, and there's some other stuff going on as well. But for air to move into and out of the lungs, the pressure in the lungs has to be greater than the pressure in the air. And that causes your diaphragm, I'm sorry, for air to move out of the lungs. Um, I think it said into and out of. For air to move out of the lungs, the pressure must be greater than the pressure in the air. And that's going to cause, uh, when your diaphragm relaxes and it squeezes your lungs, it creates an area of high pressure. And so then all of a sudden, the air trapped in your lungs is like, there's so much pressure in here, and it leaves. It goes, and it exhales. 
For air to move into the lungs, the pressure must be less than the atmosphere. And so when you take a big deep breath in, there's, very, there's a lot of empty space, and that causes all of the air to move that way. And gases and other materials will always, always, always move to the area of low pressure, okay? That is understanding pressure gradients. Um, now, talking about that, that's the same thing is true of blood pressure, you know? Um, have you guys ever been sitting around uh, your house, uh, you know, just like doing nothing, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, the door rings, and you're like, ah, the door, and you jump up, and then you run, and all of a sudden, like, your vision just goes, <laughs> you're like, oh, and you get a little dizzy for a second, you're like, oh, and then you're fine. So what that is, is that is a very sudden, very dramatic drop in your blood pressure. Basically, all of your blood was used to sitting, and then you stood up really suddenly, and all the blood wanted to stay back there. You've been relaxing. You haven't been doing any work because you've been sitting around for however long you've been sitting around. Uh, and so your blood pressure is really low because it doesn't really have to pump blood around very, you know, it's pumping blood around, but it's not working all that hard. Suddenly you did something super physical <laughs> and your brain was like, hey, I need oxygen up here, but it's all stuck on the couch. So your blood pressure bottomed out for a second and then it returned to normal and all of a sudden you shake it off and, you know, go get your pizza at the door or whatever. Um, your Amazon package, I don't know. <laughs> um, so looking at the process of ventilation, right? Ventilation is bringing air bringing gases into and out of your lungs. Now, here's the thing. This is where you are going to experience respiration. And respiration and ventilation are really similar, but technically they're different things. Ventilation is bringing gases into your lungs and out of your lungs. And for the record, those gases are not just oxygen. Um, like if you look at the composition of air, uh, Air is mostly nitrogen. There's actually more nitrogen in the air than there is um, oxygen by a pretty significant margin, actually. You can see um, all the air you breathe in, 78% of it is nitrogen, 20% um, of it is oxygen. And then you're going to find carbon dioxide because there's a lot of you know, stuff breathing. Uh, and so carbon dioxide is floating around in the air. Sometimes you breathe that back in. Um, doesn't go back into your bloodstream you know, but you did breathe it back in. Um, there's some argon, which is interesting. Uh, and then there's other gases like neon, you know, like neon signs. Um, there's stuff like that is actually, you know, floating around in the air as well. Um, so you are bringing, so that's ventilation, bringing gases into your lungs and out of your lungs. Respiration is oxygen molecules moving from one place to another. So we uh, talked about cellular respiration on day one, and then we kind of talked a little bit about it yesterday as well. Cellular respiration is where oxygen goes into a cell and CO2 leaves the cell. Well, at your lungs, oxygen is entering your blood cells and, it's le and CO2 is leaving your blood cells. So you have two versions of respiration. You have it at your lungs and you have it at your body's tissues. So there's two areas where respiration occurs. There's external respiration, which remember our human donut analogy yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are back. There's a nut. You are don't. You are a donut in two ways. <laughs> you are also exposing your lungs are part of the outside environment as well. I could thread a tube right down into my lungs right now. Um, <laughs> um, so that is also that means that this is also an outside environment. And so external, <clears throat> external respiration, speaking of <coughs> lungs there, external respiration is where you are exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide, or uh, carbon dioxide for oxygen. So external respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lungs and the atmosphere, you know, the outside world. Oxygen enters the bloodstream and CO2 exits the bloodstream. And this is happening at your lungs. Meanwhile, from the last time you took a breath, you have internal respiration. This is happening at your body's tissues. And so there is an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide with the tissues of the body and the blood. And so oxygen will exit your bloodstream and go into your cells, and CO2 will exit your cells and enter your bloodstream. 
and that takes place at your body's tissues. So, you know, what's happening is, let's just say I've got a red blood cell, it's brand new, and it's making its first trip to the lungs, right? It really hasn't had a chance to, to do very much. Well, it's going to pick up some oxygen for the very first time, right? It's going to experience external respiration. And then that little red blood cell is going to travel, let's say it's going up to my brain, right? So it travels to my heart, and then my heart pumps it up to my brain, and it delivers that oxygen through internal respiration. It drops the oxygen off, it picks up some CO2 because my brain's been doing some work, and then that blood cell travels back to my heart and it gets pumped back over to the lungs. And once it gets to the lungs, it's gonna do external respiration and it's gonna drop off the CO2 and pick up more oxygen. And then it travels back to my heart and this time it gets pumped uh, to my liver and it does internal respiration again and it drops off oxygen and picks up CO2, travels back to my heart, uh, then goes back to the lungs. And again, it does external respiration and drops off CO2 and picks up oxygen. So it's this entire process. And that's what your blood cells main job is, right? To facilitate this respiration. So um, that's where we got to look a little bit at uh, the idea of breathing, right? Breathing uh, is where we also have a couple different terms here. We have inspiration and expiration, right? So now we've got ventilation, uh, respiration, and then we've got inspiration and expiration, right? So a couple, we got a lot of Asians in this class. <laughs> um, but inspiration is the process of driving air into our lungs, right? So inspiration is when you breathe in. So your diaphragm, again, it contracts, that creates an area of low pressure and all that pressure rushes into your lungs. So it is a dome shaped muscle that relaxes to drive air out of the lungs or it contracts to flatten air and down and drive air into the lungs. So this is what's funny is inspiration, breathing in, that's the active part of breathing. That is the contracting part. When you contract your diaphragm, you are bringing air in. Relaxing your diaphragm, is what draws air out of your lungs, which is always kind of funny because like, you know, I got to say like the first time I learned this, I totally assumed it was the other way around. I thought that breathing in would be kind of just nat or it was just muscle going in both directions, you know? Um, Cause you know, you breathe so hard to, to blow out birthday candles, you know, like, right. Like I can put a lot of effort in, but what's funny about that is that's actually secondary um, respiratory muscles, not primary ones. Those are actually helper muscles that do the pushing out. They're not part of the primary version of breathing. Breathing's active phase is when you breathe in. The passive relaxing phase is when you breathe out. Um, just like the active part of, you know, lifting this coffee mug is, you know, contracting this way. And then I would relax back this way, right? Um, We'll talk more about those type of contractions uh, in a little bit. <laughs> um, I think in two days. <laughs> um, so inspiration is driving air into the lungs. Expiration is driving air out of the lungs. Um, and what that does is, again, you know, you are creating pressure gradients. Meanwhile, you also have concentration gradients. And so that's allowing those oxygen molecules to move where they need to. So when the pressure is greater than in one place than it is in the other. Like in expiration, for instance, you are you know relaxing your diaphragm and that's squeezing your lungs closed. So now there's a lot of pressure in here. And so all that air is gonna rush out of your mouth. So expiration begins with the relaxation of the diaphragm and the, what are called external intercostal muscles. Um, your external intercostals are little muscles located between each of your ribs. Uh, and that allows for a passive, you know, relaxing uh, decrease of your thoracic volume, aka it's making small, you know, a lot smaller space. Meanwhile, your inter internal intercostals will contract to actively draw that rib cage in a little bit closer. Um, and that's going to create pressure changes. So at the end of a normal, you know, respiration, 
uh, your interpleural pressure, which is the pressure inside of the, the lungs, right? Plural, again, um, pulmonary, plural, those are your lungs. Uh, the pressure is less than the barometric pressure, which is the pressure in the atmosphere. And so that is going to cause air to move. Um, there's a, they're using a lot of terminology. It's actually not very complicated. It's, you know, it's, it's area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. It's just, there's a lot of like terminology. Um, so during inspiration, it's the exact opposite, right? We can see that here. Um, we've already got it in our notes here, but during intern, during inspiration, the volume increases, which creates like a lot of, you know, low pressure, uh, and that causes, uh, you know, all that area to rush in. Um, so, uh, let's go ahead and watch the second half of this video here. I think I got to the right place. I hope I didn't skip too far forward, but actually before I do, do you guys have any questions so far? No. I've been on a, I've been on a tear. I feel like I, I should have asked you guys a while ago. <laughs> Feeling good? Yeah. All right, here we go. Picture this. You're getting ready to give a big presentation in front of like a lot of important people. You're practicing in front of your mirror and then just for a second, you forget how to speak. Suddenly you feel that familiar sting of anxiety, like an icy hand on the back of your neck. You look at yourself in that mirror and you start imagining some of the worst, worst case scenarios. Like what if you totally lose your train of thought up there? What if you bark? What if everybody gets up and leaves? Now you're really nervous. I'm getting freaked out just talking about it. So you start taking quick shallow breaths and you're feeling lightheaded and seeing stars and now you my friend are hyperventilating when we talk about respiration we tend to focus on oxygen and who could blame us it's easy to forget the equally important role that carbon dioxide plays in maintaining homeostasis your internal balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide factors heavily into all sorts of stuff especially in your blood where it can affect your blood's pressure its ph level even its temperature and now at like T minus five minutes to your presentation, all those things are out of whack because you're exhaling more CO2 than you should. You're just about to faint when a friend suddenly hands you a paper bag to breathe into, and you've never been so grateful for a lunch bag in your life because somehow it does the trick. Within seconds, you're back to normal. The drop in CO2 that occurs in your blood when you hyperventilate is called hippocapnia, and it signals a breakdown in one of the most complex and important functions that your respiratory system performs. That is, the exchange of gases inside your blood cells where the stuff your body doesn't want is swapped out for what it desperately needs. This exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen is regulated by a whole series of biological signals that your blood cells use to communicate with your tissues about what they have, what they want, and what they need to get rid of. It's almost like a code, one that it's written into your blood's chemistry in the folding of its proteins even in its temperature and acidity it's what allows you to perform strenuous physical tasks like climbing a mountain it's also what lets you reboot your whole respiratory system with nothing more than a paper bag <laughs> When we've talked about the chemistry of your blood so far, we've tended to keep things pretty simple. Like hemoglobin contains four protein chains, each of which contains an iron atom, since iron readily binds with oxygen. That's how hemoglobin transports oxygen around your body. Bada bing. But the fact is, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen isn't always the same. In some places, we want our hemoglobin to have a high affinity for oxygen so it can easily grab it out of the air. And in others, we want it to have a low affinity for oxygen so it can dump those molecules to feed our cells. So how does your hemoglobin know when to collect its precious cargo and when to let it go. Well, a lot of it has to do with a principle of chemistry known as partial pressure. One of the things that fluids always do is move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And molecules also diffuse from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. But when we talk about gases in a mixture, we need to combine the ideas of pressure and concentration. See, air is a mixture of molecules, and when you're studying the respiratory system, you often need to focus on the oxygen, which makes up about 21% of it. But that doesn't actually tell us how many oxygen molecules there are. For that, we need to know the overall air pressure since more molecules in a certain volume means more pressure. So partial pressure gives us a way of understanding how much oxygen there is based on the pressure that it's creating. Example, 
The pressure of air at sea level is about 760 millimeters of mercury, but since only about 21% of that air is oxygen, oxygen's part of that pressure, or partial pressure of oxygen, is 21% of 760, or about 160 millimeters of mercury. Now, that's just outside at sea level. When that air mixes with the air deep in your lungs, including a lot of air that you haven't exhaled yet, the partial pressure of oxygen drops to about 104 millimeters of mercury. And in the blood that's entering your lungs after most of its oxygen Oxygen has been stripped away by your hungry muscles and neurons, the oxygen partial pressure is only about 40 millimeters. This big difference in pressure makes it easy for oxygen molecules to travel from the outside air into your blood plasma because as a rule, dissolved gases always diffuse down their partial pressure gradients. This is why it's so much harder to breathe at higher altitudes. When you climb a mountain, the concentration of oxygen stays at about 21%, but the pressure gets lower, which means the partial pressure of oxygen also decreases to about 45 millimeters of mercury at the top of Mount Everest. So, the so really quickly, I just want to mention this. Um, oh, Noelle's joining us. What, is it, what do you say? Um, so I want to uh, mention this real quick. Um, so uh, the pressure changes, right? People will wear those um, respiratory masks, right? You ever see these? They call them high, they call them elevation masks or altitude masks. Um, uh, they'll sell these, right? They're these training masks that you can buy. And the idea is like, you know, they've got these little valves on them. It makes it hard to breathe. And they'll tell you that it is like training at high elevation, right? Um, because here's the thing. If you actually do train at high elevation, there's some really cool stuff that happens to your body. Um, if you go uh, hang out in Mount Everest for a little bit, right? Um, so when you do that, what will happen is because there's not very much pressure available to you, your blood cells will actually increase their ability to grab oxygen. They'll make more hemoglobin. You will actually have more red blood cells. They'll, your body will physiologically respond to high elevation. Um, uh oh, hold on one second. Kenny, are we losing you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm right here. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, when you are at high elevation, your body um, will actually respond to that high elevation by, uh, by increasing its ability to grab oxygen. Um, and that's really cool because then if you train at elevation and then you decide to go run a race at sea level, you will have a major advantage because you'll feel like, oh my gosh, there's so much oxygen in here. I can breathe so easily. And you'll actually run faster because your body will have a better use of oxygen. So people sell these training masks. Here's the thing. <laughs> this is totally not how this works. <laughs> so they sell these masks and they're like, and, and when you put them on, they're really hard to breathe. Um, I'm sure you guys have experienced that even just in you know going to the grocery store now. We got all these... You know, uh, we all have to wear masks when we go out to the grocery store and stuff. And it sometimes is really hard to breathe, right? So what these masks do is they limit how many molecules of oxygen and how many molecules of gas are able to enter because a lot of them are hitting like a roadblock. They're having trouble squeezing through the little holes. So it does make it harder to get air into your lungs but the amount of pressure from oxygen molecules is totally the same as it was before, which is why it's actually not harder to breathe when you're wearing this mask. It just feels harder to breathe. So do these masks really do anything? I don't think so. I think one thing that they can, <laughs> look at that. Uh, I think one thing that they can do is that they can help you build some mental toughness I think that like running with a mask can help you, you know, develop like being, there's Marshawn. Uh, <laughs> that's my guy. Uh, that can help you, uh, you know, it makes it harder to breathe and, you know, you can get a little tougher and then that can help you stay focused, you know, when you're working really hard during workouts and stuff. So I think that there may be some advantages to wearing these masks, but will it make your respiratory system more efficient? Absolutely not. It just doesn't work that way. That's just not how pressure gradients work. Yes, the volume of air entering is less, but the pressure of oxygen and the ability to move oxygen from one place to another remains the same. 
So and that's actually, you can keep that in mind next time you're going to the grocery store and you got to put your mask on and you're going out in public and it's, you know, um, you hear somebody going, I have a doctor's note. I can't wear a mask because it's hard for me to breathe. Uh, it's kind of not. <laughs> and we know scientifically that it's really not that hard to breathe. <laughs> You're getting the same amount of oxygen, even if it feels psychologically different. Now, if somebody says they have a doctor's note, they probably have a psychological, they're probably, they probably do. They probably have anxiety and that's probably what's keeping them. Um, but not because they have like a lung disorder. Um, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and finish. Yeah. And in the video, they was putting something examples about the people is running and the people is uh, hiking or something like that. And oh. what about other people is is doing the scuba diving? Uh, what was that? I'm sorry. What was that last part? Yeah, there are uh, examples about the people running and the people um, hiking. Yeah. And what about all the people is doing a scuba diving? Oh, yeah, and scuba diving. Yeah, scuba diving is where, yeah, there actually are pressure Um, Because you're, you know, deep below, like, sea level. Um, but, yeah, like, I wear my mask. You know, I go up to my favorite place to go running is uh, up at Fryman Canyon. Um, and, you know, I'm doing, like, uphill sprints in that freaking thing. Uh, hmm. <laughs> and it sucks. But I do believe that it has made me a little tougher because um, it's so uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah, but the oxygen when you are breathing and uh, oh, when you using the tank and everything, mm -hmm. you you uh, the pressure of the air and the, all the gases in the water too. Yeah, it is affected at your at your at your lungs. Yeah, it's actually easier, right? I would assume because you'd be at even lower pressure. Mm -hmm. I've never been scuba diving, but I've got two roommates. No, I do. I do. That's why I tell you. You're certified. My roommates are huge scuba divers. They love it. And I've, I've never been. I will do it sometime next year. <laughs> once, once the apocalypse is over. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and go back into this video here. Increases to about 45 millimeters of mercury at the top of Mount Everest. So the partial pressure of oxygen at the top of the highest peak in the world is almost the same as the deoxygenated blood that's entering your lungs. So basically, there is no partial pressure gradient, which makes it really hard to get oxygen into your blood. But let's get back to the red blood cells. Remember that the globin in your hemoglobin is a protein. And when proteins bind to stuff, they tend to change shape. And that shape change can make the protein more or less likely to bind to other stuff. When an empty hemoglobin runs into an oxygen molecule, things are a little awkward. It's like a first date. Bonding isn't so easy. But once they finally <laughs> bind, the hemoglobin suddenly changes shape, which makes it easier for other oxygen molecules to attach, like friends gathering around the lunch table. That affinity for joining in, or cooperativity as it's known, continues until all four binding sites are taken and the molecule is fully saturated. Now your hemoglobin is known as oxyhemoglobin, or HBO2, which is not, not why the cable network is called that. That's the home box office. Anyway, by the time the blood leaves the lungs, each hemoglobin is fully saturated. The oxygen partial pressure in your plasma is about 100 millimeters, and now it is ready to be delivered to where it is needed most. Active tissues like the brain, heart, and muscles are always hungry for oxygen. They burn through it quickly, lowering the oxygen partial pressure around them to about 40 millimeters. So when the blood arrives on the scene, oxygen moves down the gradient from the plasma to the tissues to feed those hungry cells. That makes the oxygen partial pressure in your plasma drop, so your hemoglobin starts to give up more of its oxygen to the plasma. But partial pressures are only part of what's prodding your hemoglobin to give up the goods. All of that metabolic activity going on in your tissues is also producing other triggers in the form of waste products, specifically heat and CO2. Both of those things activate the release of more oxygen by lowering hemoglobin's affinity for it. Say you're climbing that mountain again and your thighs are feeling the burn. Red blood cells saturated with oxygen are going to the muscle tissue in your quads where the hemoglobin can dump a bunch of O2 because of the lower partial pressures of oxygen in your muscles. But a hardworking quad will also heat up the surrounding tissues and that rise in temperature changes the shape of hemoglobin. And it does it in such a way that it lowers its affinity for O2. So when those red blood cells hit that warm active tissue, they release even more oxygen, like 20% more beyond what partial pressures would trigger. But wait, there's- Hold on. 
Uh, one thing I want to mention, just because he's not going to mention it in the video, that is why it is so important to warm up. Like getting your core temperature a little bit elevated before you start working out will make it easier for your body to deliver oxygen to your body's, uh, your muscle cells. And when your muscle cells have more oxygen, they can output more work. So two athletes who might be identical, who both go try to do the same activity, if one of them warmed up and one of them didn't, the warmed up athlete will probably perform better. Not to mention that all the heat also makes it easier for stuff to expand, which means it's not going to be as stiff, which means you're also less likely to injure yourself. But that's a different conversation. More carbon dioxide triggers the release of oxygen too, because it also binds to the hemoglobin, changing its shape again, lowering its affinity for oxygen still more. And as oxygen jumps ship, the hemoglobin can pick up more CO2. Finally, just in case the hemoglobin isn't getting the message at this point, there's one more trigger that your respiratory system has up its sleeve. The spike in CO2 that's released by your active muscle tissues actually makes your blood more acidic. Since your blood is mostly water, when CO2 dissolves in it, it forms carbonic acid, which breaks down into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Those ions bind to the hemoglobin, changing its shape yet again, further lowering its affinity for oxygen. So now, at last, your tissues have the oxygen they need, and your red blood cells are stuck with all this CO2 that they need to get rid of. Your red blood cells ride the vein train back to the lungs, where they encounter a new wave of freshly inhaled oxygen. And when that O2 binds to the hemoglobin, which again is hard at first, it eventually changes its shape back to the way it was when we started, which decreases its affinity for CO2. So the hemoglobin drops its carbon dioxide, which moves down its partial pressure gradient into the air of your lungs so you can exhale it and the whole thing can start all over again. Now, if that isn't enough to make you hyperventilate, I'm not sure what is. <laughs> well, this brings us back to that unfortunate episode you had before your big presentation. This whole complex code of chemical signals that I just described, well, it assumes that what your cells and tissues are telling each other is actually true. But as we all know, sometimes our bodies don't mean what they say. Thanks, buddy. Like when you're freaking out about your presentation, your sympathetic nervous system makes your heart race and your breathing increase to prepare you to fight or flee. The problem is, there's nothing to actually fight or flee from, so your muscles aren't actually doing anything, so they're not using all the extra oxygen you're breathing in. And they also aren't producing the extra CO2 that you're suddenly exhaling all over the place. So when you start to exhale CO2 faster than your cells release it, its concentration in your blood drops. And with less carbonic acid around, your blood's pH starts to rise. And you know what else? While low blood pH does things like change the shape of your hemoglobin to deliver oxygen, high pH causes vasoconstriction. Normally, this is supposed to divert blood from the parts you're not using during times of stress, like your digestive organs, to the parts that you are using. But when you hyperventilate, this constriction happens everywhere, which means less blood is delivered to your brain, which makes you lightheaded. Luckily, that trick with the breathing into the paper bag, it really does work. It works because it lets you breathe back in all of the CO2 you just breathed out. So the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the bag is higher, which forces that CO2 into your blood, which lowers its pH, and you get back to homeostasis. And of course, homeostasis is the key to life. And you know, also to a successful presentation. If you were able to remain calm today, you learned how <laughs> your blood cells exchange oxygen and CO2 to maintain homeostasis. We talked about partial pressure gradients and how they, along with changes in blood temperature, acidity, and CO2 concentrations, change how hemoglobin binds to gases in your blood. And you learned how the thing with the bat works. Of course, we must say thank you to our patrons on Patreon who help make Crash Course possible through their monthly contributions, not just for themselves, but for everyone. If you like Crash Course and want to help us keep making videos like this one, you can go to patreon.com slash Crash Course. This episode was filmed in the Dr. Cheryl C. Kinney Crash Course Studio. It was written by Kathleen Yale. The script was edited by Blake Tipestino. And our consultant is Dr. Brandon Jackson. It was directed and edited by Nicole Sweeney. Our sound designer is Michael Aranda. And the graphics team is Bob Cafe. Okay. So, uh, let's talk about everything we just talked about there. So, um, when we're looking at uh, your lung volumes, right? So, one thing that uh, I just want to mention before, the one or one one thing that we want to go over, but that that he didn't go over, there are different volumes in your lungs uh, in terms of how much total gas is in there, right? Like how much like overall gas you have access to. Um, that's like the, your different lung volume. So if your lungs are open, you know, this much versus this much versus this much, right? 
Um, and those lung volumes are relatively important because, you know, uh, it's going to be based on your physical conditioning. If you continually learn how to uh, contract your diaphragm and relax your diaphragm and it gets stronger, you will be able to draw more oxygen into your lung. This is why doing cardio um, is one of the fastest things that you can actually improve in the world of fitness. Um, it just requires consistency. Um, that and then there's also some enzyme stuff that's going on there as well, uh, which happens fairly quickly. Um, but your age, that's another one. Your, your, you know, that's going to change your lung capacity. Your gender, men actually have larger lungs than women do. Um, and then there are like some surface area differences there. And then body size, um, you know, uh, particularly like if you've ever heard of like sleep apnea, right? Um, sleep apnea is a very common condition that obese individuals can sometimes deal with because there's just simply a lot of like body weight that can happen actually in bodybuilders too. Uh, bodybuilders will actually sometimes get sleep apnea because they're just so heavy and your body gets so relaxed when you're sleeping that it's actually pressing down and all of a sudden like, you know, they'll be sleeping and then they're like breathing and then they'll stop breathing and then they'll go <gasps> and it wakes them up. Uh, that's sleep apnea. And that's where like, you know, there's just not enough like muscle to kind of, you know, your muscles got so relaxed, they weren't able to contract easily enough to dry your lungs open. So there's a couple different uh, things that we have to talk about with lung volume here. Now, just so you guys are aware, I actually don't think I had to memorize all these back in the day and it is just not actually that helpful. Um, so there's a couple that are important. Yeah. Um, there's a couple that are important, but like, I'm going to tell you the, like the, the ones that you want to know that they'll ask you about. Um, but don't feel like you have to like flashcard every single one of these terms. I think honestly, this is good information if you're going to become like a respiratory therapist, <laughs> uh, but not really that handy for, for us. So your different lung volumes that are associated with the different parts of breathing. One of the most important ones is just the baseline, which is what is referred to as tidal volume. Um, think of it as like the tide, right? It kind of sounds like the tide when somebody's breathing, right? It's like, air coming in and then air going out and then air coming in. You guys are all experiencing, you guys are all using your tidal volume right now. It is normal, what we call quiet breathing. Um, normal breathing of just drawing air in and drawing air out in a very normal fashion. That's your tidal volume, right? And that's the volume of gas uh, that's, you know, coming in and coming out during a normal breath. Now you also have your inspiratory reserve volume. That's the maximal amount of air that can be drawn in after a normal breath in. So for instance, like if I do like tidal volume, right? Let's say I do a normal breath in, it's about there, right? I'm losing a little bit because I'm talking, but my inspiratory reserve volume is all the space that was left. You know, I didn't take a big deep breath in, I just took a normal breath in. So the amount of space left, that's my inspiratory reserve. And then there is also your expiratory reserve. So if I do a normal breath out, well, I could always breathe a little bit more, right? That little bit that's left, that's my expiratory reserve. So that's like the maximum in, the maximum out. That's a pretty large range, like, Right? Well, that, the maximum amount in versus the maximum amount, it's like all of a sudden I pass out. Uh, <laughs> I should do that. It'd be a funny bit for the evening class. I just, I'll pass out to the side of the camera. Um, that's my vital capacity. Your vital capacity is the maximum amount of air drawn in versus the maximum amount of air pushed out. And then another term that we have here is what is referred to as your minute ventilation. And that's the volume of air. That's the amount of gas that you are moving in and moving out um, in one minute's time. In the same way that like your heart rate is the number of beats per minute and your stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped per beat. What we call your cardiac output is the amount of blood that you pump per minute, right? Um, that's the amount of blood pump per minute. It's based on two things, how much blood is being pumped every time and how often your heart is beating. Well, your minute ventilation is calculated by how much oxygen you are drawing in per breath times how often you are drawing in that breath. And so it's the product of your tidal volume and your frequency of breath. Um, and let me just show you a little chart here because I think a chart's a really helpful way to see this stuff. Uh, lung capacities... Uh, tidal volume 
Conspiratories. That should be enough um, to get the chart that I want. There we go. Oh, God. Acronyms. We don't want acronyms. <laughs> all right, so there we go. Um, so you can see, like, here's normal, quiet breathing, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, your roommate decides to try to scare you, so they jump out from behind the corner, and you go, wah, right? And then you take a big, deep breath in, and then they're like, you know, the moment is over, you're like, oh, it's okay. And so you take a big, deep breath out, right? And then it returns back to your title volume. There is a little bit more in there, by the way. Actually, one that we didn't mention is your residual volume. You can see there is a little bit more space in your lungs. Residual volume is like how much room would be left in your lungs if your lungs like collapsed, you know, which we don't want to experience. But it's the little bit, of, you know, it, all that, that big exhale that you made is not exactly perfect. It was huge and it got most of the oxygen out. But, you know, technically there's just a little bit of space left. And that's your, that's the inspiratory reserve. I have a question. <clears throat> um, so, you know how when you get the air knocked out of you, yeah. that all be like um, that excess air because I'm already breathing normally. But so the air getting the air knocked out, yeah, kind of. Um, it feels that way. It definitely yeah. is. Yeah, it's scary, right? Like, there's nothing. I mean, I used to get it happen to me. I was even skinnier than this when I was a kid, um, if you can imagine that. And like, man, like I would get the air knocked out of me all the time because I'd be like playing sports or something with everybody who was just much bigger than me, and they'd be like, "Bam!" I'd go flying. <laughs> um, and like, you know, when you get it out, you're it's scary. You're like, you can't breathe in, right? What that actually is, is actually, it's not necessarily that you messed up your volume, it's that you are spasming your diaphragm. It's really similar to the hiccups, actually. Um, they're not quite the same thing, but they are very, very similar to each other. And basically, you punched yourself, and it's like you're getting kind of, it's kind of like a side, you're getting cramped up, and now you can't get that breath in, and all of a sudden, <sighs> you know, you're able to finally get that muscle to contract properly and it's able to, to draw your lungs open. But yeah, that's the worst, right? <laughs> it happens to kids all the time. Um, I haven't had the air knocked out of me in like decades. I haven't, that hasn't happened to me in years now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but it used to happen to me all the time. <laughs> all right. Um, so let's go ahead and look at that gas exchange one more time. Uh, we already kind of talked about it just a little bit, but remember, at your lungs, you are experiencing what we call external respiration, right? Um, this is, you know, uh, at the outside where you are at the lungs, you are exchanging any of the carbon dioxide, which is like a byproduct of you breathing at a cellular level. You are exchanging that carbon dioxide for more oxygen so that you can get back to those cells and get them to breathe again. So gas exchanges take place in two places inside the body. They're gonna take place at your, uh, between the alveoli and what are called your pulmonary capillaries. Remember I said earlier, capillaries are the little tiny blood vessels that cover tissues, right? Um, and so at the your alveoli, those little popcorn shaped sacs are covered in those blood vessels. And so that is where um, your pulmonary capillaries are microscopic blood vessels that form and they cover your alveoli. And what is going to happen is oxygen is going to move from the lungs, so from the outside environment, and diffuse into your blood cells. So it's going to look like this. Oxygen is going to move from outside the lungs over here into the inside of the lungs, which is here at your blood cells. And actually, we can label that. Um, we'll label it here. We'll say uh, this is the uh, lungs over here. And this is the blood cells. Okay, so oxygen is gonna move from the lungs into your blood cells uh, with that external exchange, right? And CO2, CO2 is gonna move from your blood cells into your lungs, right? So that's what's happening with that external exchange. Um, and then at the body's tissues, the exact opposite is going to happen. At your body's tissue level, 
gas will move and be exchanged between your body's cells and the capillaries. So if it's your brain cells, the muscle cells, um, cells in like your organs, whatever. But the exact opposite is going to happen here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make like a copy of this picture. Um, let's see here. We'll copy the. Oh, hold on. So at your body's tissues, right, uh, we're going to have tissues here. And then at your blood cells, and what's going to happen is this is going to move in the exact opposite direction. Instead, your tissues are going to drop off CO2, and they're going to pick up oxygen. So it's going to move in the exact opposite direction, right? Oxygen is going to go into the tissues, and CO2 uh, is going to go into the blood cells, OK? So the reverse, right? Um, and that's kind of one of the things we, you know, they want you to know. One thing that some new students get tripped up on here, and, and you'll see this in like test questions and homework questions, um, make sure you are paying attention to like what direction stuff is heading, you know? Um, and that's, it's the same thing tomorrow. We're going to look at the cardiovascular system. Um, you know, you've got arteries which go away and veins go towards the heart. Um, it's a lot of direction questions. Uh, Homework number two in this class, it's not hard, but just make sure you don't get tripped up on falling for like, you know, mix, mixing up your directions. Um, at the lungs, you are getting rid of CO2 and picking up oxygen. At your tissues, you are dropping off oxygen and picking up CO2. So just try to get those directions memorized as best you can. Um, you know, I, I honestly care much more that you guys know the concepts uh, than I care about you really being able to like say that over and over and over again. Um, so I wouldn't spend like 10 hours trying to memorize that and make sure that you're a master of directions or anything. Um, but just be aware, you know, the better you understand those directions, the easier it's going to be for you to understand why our muscles need certain things and how, you know, when you're training a client, why it's so important to warm up, why it's so important to give them a little bit of time to breathe, how long of a rest period they get. All of this information right now is going to translate directly to our sets, our reps, our tempos, our warmups, our cool downs, you know, all of that stuff. Um, work to rest ratios, which is one of my favorite things to talk about in terms of cardio. All of this, you know, is relevant to that. Um, so let's go ahead and wrap everything up today. Uh, at least the, the, the important stuff. There's a few more slides left, but it, it kind of... Uh, tapers off at the end here. So uh, let's look at how all of this is getting transported. So he mentioned it in the video. So all of your red blood cells have this special protein on them. Remember I told you yesterday that you get a lot of different types of proteins throughout your body. <laughs> One of those proteins is called hemoglobin. Uh, this is coming from the word heme, which is actually, uh, it actually means blood. Um, and then globin, uh, which actually is related to the word oxygen. So this is your blood oxygen. And that is, uh, actually wait, heme doesn't mean blood, sorry. Wait, heme means iron, I think. Hold on. <laughs> Etym hold on just a second, this is gonna drive me crazy. Uh, etymology of hemoglobin. Uh, heme, does heme mean blood? Globin, uh, which is something. Yeah, whoops. Heme is, heme is uh, oh no, yeah, it's blood. Yeah, heme is blood. <laughs> Sorry, um, that was going to drive me nuts. Uh, so hemoglobin is a protein. And what's cool about this protein, guys, this is my favorite thing, um, is that it actually has a molecule of iron in it. So remember yesterday I talked about how you've got to eat some inorganic stuff, like some metals. Metals need to be in your diet. One of those metals is iron. So when you look at a molecule of hemoglobin, it looks like this. Um, it's a little protein that lives in your blood cells. Remember also yesterday I told you how I like to draw proteins? They're the only mm -hmm. good metals. Told you. So <laughs> you got... 
Um, uh, hemoglobin, and it's got four little iron molecules in it, iron atoms. And here's what's kind of cool about iron. Iron and oxygen, they get along really, really well. Iron likes to bind to oxygen. Anybody in here have a cast iron pan? <laughs> what is it? Cast iron pan, do you have one of those? Did you, uh, ever forget to, uh, you ever forget to dry that thing off or you ever forget to oil it and then it turns oh. rusty really quickly? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so that rust turns kind of a brightish red color, right? Um, well, that is why your blood is actually red is because it has so much iron in it. Um, and there is never a point, I know that when we draw blood vessels, you know, I know that like when we're drawing, like if I look at like blood vessels, um, you know, we usually draw them like this, where you see like there's the blue ones and the red ones, right? Um, for the record, there is never any point in your body where your blood is ever blue. Your blood is always red, always, always, always. But it is either super, super, super dark red, or it is super, super, super Sorry. bright red. If it's bright red, it means it's got lots of oxygen in it. If it's dark red, it means that it's given up all of its oxygen um, or it, all that oxygen has dissolved. Um, and that's why when you have like super dark red, you know, like that's why your veins look bluish colored under the skin is because when you mix like dark red with like the pigments, of, you know, it kind of comes out to a bluish color. But there's never any time where blood is blue in your body. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, there is blue blood out there in the world. Actually, there's certain types of starfish. Um, that's what I thought. I thought uh, red, blue is blood is blue until it gets the oxygen. A lot of people. Think blood. That. Yeah, a lot of people. I thought that when I, was in, I thought that when I was in school too. Yeah, you hear that all the time, um, but it's not true. It's because your blood uses iron, and when iron binds to oxygen, it turns a bright red color. That's actually also why Mars is red, for the record. Uh, you know, the red planet. Um, it has a lot of iron in its soil. Uh, more than we find here on Earth. And so that's, it, it, it's, you know, Mars is rusty. <laughs> you can think of it that way. Um, but here's the thing, here's what's kind of fun. Uh, starfish, uh, they actually have blue blood, uh, at least some of them do. Uh, and certain octopuses, they actually have blue blood as well. And it's because they actually use copper to bind oxygen instead of using iron. And what color does copper turn when it's exposed to oxygen? It turns bluish greenish, you know, and that's why the Statue of Liberty is the color it is, because that is also made of copper. The Statue of Liberty is supposed to look like this. <laughs> you know, originally, <laughs> originally it looked like that, but then it was exposed to a whole bunch of air, and guess what? It turned a bluish greenish color. So we don't have blue blood, we use iron. Um, I think that's another word uh, for anemic. You can be anemic if you uh, uh, if you have uh, low iron yep. in your blood. Yeah, so and that is exactly what anemia is. Anemia is a lack of iron in your blood. So you might have plenty of like blood cells, but unfortunately those cells can't really do what they're there to do. So you need to make sure that you're including iron into your diet. Um, that's a pretty common problem amongst women. Uh, you will hear of like anemia problems pretty frequently. Guys, it's pretty rare for, for men to deal with anemia. Um, we don't like menstruate, so we don't have a trouble, like we don't lose a lot of like blood. Um, and also like, again, larger volume. So it's a little easier for us to carry blood. That's one of the very, very, very small differences between like men and women. Um, and so you'll see it sometimes in like multivitamins. Uh, you know, there'll be like men's multivitamins versus women's multivitamins. Sometimes you're like, why are there two different types of multivitamins? They're both, you know, humans. It doesn't really matter, right? They both need the same nutrients. Well, if you put iron in men's multivitamins, you can actually get too much iron in your blood and it can make you really sick um, because then you actually have too much affinity for oxygen. And now suddenly it's actually very difficult for you to bind that oxygen uh, and exchange it because it basically just stays in your blood cells rather than moving to your tissues. Um, and then like uh, you'll see a lot of times there will be iron supplemented into women's multivitamins instead. Um, so again, I don't even like taking multivitamins, so I think they should all be avoided, but uh, there's, there's a little bit. So 
Um, so hemoglobin is a protein that contains a molecule of iron and it's used to carry your oxygen. Red blood cells are saturated with hemoglobin proteins, which is why red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen and CO2. That's the other thing. Hemoglobin also binds very, very well to CO2. Now, uh, I do want to mention myoglobin real quick. Myo, which comes from the word meaning muscle, and globin coming from like, you know, oxygen protein, right? So myoglobin is a special version of hemoglobin. And it's a protein that is in your muscle fibers and it binds to oxygen and it delivers it to your mitochondria. So remember like your muscle cells, they're some of the, you know, most energy hungry cells inside of your body. So you're gonna find a ton of mitochondria, which are energy producers, right? They're the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, you're going to find a ton of those in your nervous system, and you're going to find a ton of those in your muscular system, because those two types of tissue need to produce energy like crazy. And so luckily, we have myoglobin, which can pick up oxygen from a molecule of hemoglobin, and it can carry it to our muscles and allow our muscles to do all the work that they need to do. Um, so myoglobin is a term that you also are going to see a lot. Uh, and here's what's really cool. You guys have heard me, uh, some of you have heard me talk about this, uh, Charlie and Noel, um, but uh, everybody else, here's your first intro into a little bit of talking about like repetition schemes and stuff. Um, you have two different types of muscle fibers inside of your body. We are going to talk more about this when we get to the muscles on Friday, um, but the two types of muscle fibers that you've got inside of your body, we call them slow twitch and we call them fast twitch. And uh, those are just kind of nicknames based on their characteristics. Slow twitch muscle fibers, one of their characteristics is that they have more myoglobin than fast twitch fibers. They also have more mitochondria than fast twitch fibers, which means that your slow twitch fibers, they're really good at producing energy at a for like long durations so for instance all the muscles that are keeping you guys upright right now like the muscles in your core that are like allowing you to you know sit upright without like falling you know those are actually all slow twitch fibers your calves have a lot of slow twitch fibers in them you know so that you can run for long periods of time your endurance muscle fibers are your slow twitch fibers now your fast twitch fibers are like the ones that are in your glutes and your quads you know these big big, powerful contractions, right? Um, and they don't have as much myoglobin in them, which is why they get tired faster. Um, but they, instead of relying on, when we go back to cellular respiration, remember the mitochondria can produce energy for super long durations. And glycolysis, which is happening in the fluid portion of the cell, right? They produce energy really rapidly, but for very short durations. And that's another reason why slow twitch fibers have endurance and fast twitch fibers have uh, uh, less endurance. Um, but slow twitch fibers tend to be smaller in size, so they can't create very powerful contractions. Fast twitch fibers are much larger in size, and they are much stronger and able to create more powerful contractions. So based on what I just said, you can start to understand why repetition schemes are different for different clients. If I'm training a marathon runner, I'm going to focus on developing their ability to make more myoglobin. I'm going to focus on making more mitochondria. And I'm going to try to build up their endurance. And if I'm training a power lifter, I'm going to focus more on training in glycolysis. I'm going to keep the duration really short. I'm going to keep the rest really long. I'm going to make them lift really, really, really heavy. And so that is where we start to see five reps versus eight reps versus 12 reps versus 15 versus 20. Those are all very different rep schemes. Um, and we will talk more about that in our actual program design classes. I'm going to give you some real numbers um, later down the line. Um, but that's why we have to do all this physiology stuff first, because, you know, it's one thing to just memorize the reps and then have a client and be like, all right, you're going to do 12 reps. And they're like, why? And then you're like, because I said so, <laughs> right? There's, there's that version versus the trainer who's like, well, actually, it's because you told me your goals are this. And 12 repetitions responds this way physiologically in your body. And then your client goes, holy crap, you know a lot of stuff. I'm going to, all right, I'm going to keep paying. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's our goal. Um, 
All right, so um, that's actually kind of the end of uh, the notes here, but there are a couple few slides here. This is sort of some extra information at the end here. So carbon dioxide is also transported in your blood. Um, it's going to be uh, transported in a couple different ways here. Some of it is actually dissolved uh, into like the plasma of your blood. Um, some, most of it is transported as what is called bicarbonate. Um, and then some of it is broken down into what is called I always have such a hard time with this word, carb, carbaminohemoglobin, Whew. Uh, <laughs> which is where like it'll actually attach to, to hemoglobin and, and lower its affinity um, for carbon dioxide and increase its affinity for oxygen. Um, so that's how carbon dioxide is also transported in your blood. Uh, basically, when it gets to your body's tissues, you know, uh, at this point, your cells are really good at picking up carbon dioxide, and they're not so good at holding on to oxygen. And so that's why oxygen leaves the cell, the blood cell, and, and then carbon dioxide enters the blood cell. And then the exact opposite is going to happen when you get to the lungs. And that's because bicarbonate doesn't have a very good affinity to stay in the blood cell when your blood is very acidic. And it doesn't have a very good affinity to stay in there when your temperature is high. And so uh, when those two things change, right, you've got really hot muscles uh, at a tissue level and you've got relatively cool lungs because you are breathing in um, and that's cooling everything down. Uh, and then it, you know, it flips in those directions. So that's how carbon dioxide and oxygen are uh, uh, exchanged for each other. Now, there are a couple other things that we do need to consider here uh, if we were looking at things on a very, very, very deep level. But this isn't the kind of stuff that, like I said, comes up during like a normal session. Um, but there is something called diffusing capacity. And that's the rate at which uh, gases are able to diffuse across a membrane. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for those gases to be able to move. Or maybe uh, you have a lower capacity to diffuse those things because maybe you were a smoker. And so there's stuff in your lungs and it's harder for those oxygen molecules to travel through all that sludge. You know, it's like wading through high water, trying to get into your blood cells. That's going to be your diffusing capacity. And that's one of the things that can lower your ability to breathe during exercise. And there's also transit time. And transit time is the time required for red blood cells to move through a capillary. So, you know, if you have high blood pressure, Sometimes you will notice like it feels harder to breathe and it's like, well, wait a minute, oxygen doesn't have anything to do with the pressure in my blood. Well, it kind of does. Yeah, no, not chemically wise, like chemistry wise, oxygen's going to move to wherever it's going to move, you know, based on chemistry. But like, you know, if you have like a lot of pressure and it's very difficult to move blood from one place to another, and it's just difficult to get this blood cell from here to over here, right? your transit time is going to be longer. And so blood pressure issues can also affect your ability to breathe. It will feel, you will feel like you have a shortness of breath. Um, and then there is also, like I mentioned earlier. Ain't that, ain't that usually blood clots? Uh, yeah. And then there are blood clots. Yeah. Um, it's related for sure. Uh, if you have a blood clot, um, that is because maybe there is a super high area of pressure. And so now blood is actually getting trapped. And we haven't talked about this, but one of the, and we're, I don't think we are going to talk about this, but one of the other unique properties of blood is the ability to clot. Um, you know, blood cells have these little fibers on them that once they get activated, like if blood cells rub against each other too much, um, it will activate this ability to grab each other. And so uh, that blood cell will grab that one, and then that'll grab another one, and grab another one, and another one, until eventually you basically have a little scab inside of your blood vessels. Um, and that's what a blood clot is. Uh, that is also going to make it very difficult to move blood around. And because blood is what's carrying oxygen, yes, it is very hard to move oxygen around as well. Um, so we definitely want to make sure we don't end up with high blood pressure. Um, that's a really important. We want to keep our cardiovascular system strong, you know? Yeah. Hey, um, ibuprofen is a good blood thinner. No, um, aspirin. Aspirin is a good blood thinner. Um, yeah, uh, aspirin has a blood thinning effect. Ibuprofen doesn't do that. Ibuprofen is just a, um, it's a pain receptor thing. 
Um, it's a non, it's an NSAID, which stands N-S-A-I-D, non-steroidical anti-inflammatory drug. Um, aspirin though does thin out your blood. It draws water into your blood, um, which if you have high blood pressure and you start to feel like you're having, if you're getting like a super lightheaded um, and you're having like a really like, you know, that's why they say like, um, if you ever know somebody who's having a heart attack, um, go get Bayer, uh, which is an aspirin. And so you give them that aspirin, it can thin out their blood and make it easier for that blood to flow. And it could, you know, could potentially save their life. Um, uh, if you have, high, if you have high blood pressure and you are not on an actual blood pressure medication though, um, you know, talk to your doctor about doing any of this. Um, or if you are going to take aspirin, I don't know, take a, take a baby aspirin or something. Um, I'd be cautious about, you know, self-regulating, you know, thinning out your own blood. Um, but one of the best things you can do that will thin out your blood if you do have high blood pressure is staying hydrated. Um, one of the components of blood, actually, I'm just going to show you this because, uh, because we're talking about it. Um, we're going to talk about this. I think, to, I think this is going to come up tomorrow. Um, but blood components, um, and, you know, all day today, I've been probably just shortening it to blood and I've just said blood. Um, I should have technically been saying blood cells all day. All of these things are moving into blood cells. Um, red blood cells in particular. You've actually got a lot of different stuff in your blood, you know, and it looks like if you look at, if you were to like spin your blood super fast, it would actually look like all the stuff would separate. Here's your red blood cells. So only about 44% of your blood is red blood cells. 1% of it is your platelets and your white blood cells. That's your immune system right there. And then this 55% is plasma, which is mostly water. Some of it's proteins and glycogen, or not glycogen, but glucose, um, hormones, all the other stuff that happens to be in your blood is going to be found in your plasma. Um, but most of plasma is water. So if you want to, if you're having blood pressure problems, guys, um, have you ever noticed that like you just had a high blood pressure day, you're starting to get a headache or sort of feel a little lightheaded, go drink water, you are probably dehydrated. Um, again, water is crazy, crazy, crazy important. Uh, my mom has really bad blood pressure problems, partially because of what we were talking about in the video. She's a crazy- I know your, body, I know your body's like 90% water, right? Uh, a little bit less, but yeah, yep. Oh. What is it? How... I think it's 80%, but you're close, 83%. Nice job. <laughs> but yeah, you are mostly water. So go drink water. You should be drinking. I mean, like I said, the recommendations are, are, are 3.7 liters a day for men. Um, round that up to a gallon. Can't hurt you. Go drink a gallon of water a day. It's easy. You know, that is four of these. <laughs> um, so anyway, last slide here, oxygen delivery, right? Uh, it is the product of your cardiac output. So the amount of oxygen that you can deliver throughout your body, and this is where we're going to start pivoting into tomorrow's conversation, where we talk about the cardiovascular system. Um, but it is made of your cardiac output, and cardiac output we're going to talk about tomorrow, but that is how often your heart beats times how much blood is pumped per beat. If your heart's strong, it can pump a lot of blood in one go right? Um, if your heart's weak, it has to make up for it and it has to pump more often in order to like make up for the fact that it can't pump very much blood every contraction. And then it is also made up of the arterial content of oxygen, aka how much oxygen is in your blood cells. So um, that is how we, uh, you know, measure how much oxygen is going to be delivered. So your muscle's ability to extract oxygen and sustain its aerobic power, aka your endurance, um, within seconds to minutes of vigorous exercise depends on how much oxygen is available to your tissues. And that is going to depend on how much oxygen you can bring into your lungs and get to your blood cells. And it's going to depend on how well your heart can get that blood to wherever it's going. And that's why we have this two-day conversation today. Um, so we've talked a little bit about like, you know, we talked yesterday about like getting glucose in and fats into our diet for energy production, right? We need those ingredients in order to be able to produce ATP. Well, guess what? We also need oxygen to be able to produce ATP. 
And tomorrow we're gonna to talk about how we deliver all of that stuff when we get into the cardiovascular system. And that is day three. You guys got any questions, <laughs> comments, concerns? Random bits of trivia? No? <laughs> All right, guys. Well, if you don't got anything for me, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording, uh, and I'll see everybody tomorrow.